Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Coffee and Open Source, a place to meet some new friends, have some great conversations, and maybe learn something along the way. I'm your host, Isaac Levin. And if you're enjoying the interviews here, be sure to like, subscribe, follow wherever you're watching or listening. Also, if you're interested or know any folks that would be interested in coming on chatting, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. My handle there is Isaac R. Levin, or reach out to me on Mastodon. My handle there is Isaac R. Levin at Fossen.org. So, all right. I'm excited for my conversation. Uh, uh, this is a good friend of mine. We've been on the conference circuit together. We've had all sorts of great conversations about things in tech, not tech, and I'm really looking forward to it. So today, my guest is Lizzie Siegel. Lizzie, do you want to say hello? Introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Isaac. Okay, so I'm Lizzie, based in San Francisco, California, and I'm a developer evangelist at Twilio. Isaac and I met at Orlando Code Camp a few months ago, and we yeah. had so much fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was a good so trip. Yeah, so we met in March of 2023 for people listening to this in the future. Hello, future. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation because one, I think Lizzie, you're are very uh, full of energy and very excited about technology, and I and I feel the same way. And I'd like to kind of get an idea of how you got started in tech. So, like, do you remember the point in time when you came across technology? Maybe you were younger. Maybe you were already in school, and you realized, like, hey, I like technology. Like, maybe I should just keep messing around with it. Yes. So I grew up in the Bay Area, but my family, no one worked in tech. Oh, wow. I saw, Surprising. I thought, <laughs> yeah. I saw tech companies pop up. I saw the ads and I wasn't into it. My twin brother was the math person and mm -hmm. I was like, I was not into math and science, but I wanted to be a middle school math teacher for a long time because I wanted to make it easier for other people I knew who, like me, had trouble with different math concepts. Sure. And then senior year of high school, after I'd already committed to a liberal arts college, I, my AP Calc teacher told some women, some girl students about this all girls coding camp at Stanford. And he didn't really, I wasn't in that group, but mm -hmm. I was listening. And I was like, I'll go too. I wasn't doing well in AP Calc. I, so he didn't tell me, sure, but I sure. went to this all girls uh, one day coding camp at Stanford. And it was so inspiring. The instructors were Stanford computer science students, all women. They were cool. They oh, played awesome. volleyball. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Like they dressed nicely. They debunked all these myths I had about programming. And they showed me that it could be fun. Yeah. How you could like solve problems. You could work not just in tech, but you could work at Disney for a magazine or a newspaper. Yeah. And you could use it to solve problems. And I was hooked after that day. That's awesome. So, uh, so a couple of things that are interesting there. So firstly, like you had an interest in math, right? And I think one of the things that I'm always very interested about with folks that get into computers, computer science, technology, what have you, is like there is kind of an assumption that you have to like be good at math, right? So mm -hmm. at one point, like did you realize like, oh, like this math thing is important for me? Or like I guess my point is did you enjoy math or did you see math as a good way to like get into some career or something like that? Yes. In college, I quickly realized that math was not necessary for computer science. Yeah. But I do think it helps you problem solve. It helps you yes. see a problem through. And my thesis, uh, one of my thesis advisors, I remember t uh, her telling me, math is different from programming. Math, sure. the better you get, the longer or the faster a problem takes. Mm -hmm. In programming, the better you get, maybe the slower it gets, or like yeah. it doesn't really get faster. It shouldn't necessarily. Yeah, yeah I, I I jokingly say that I kind of topped out at math like very very early in university. Like I realized that like oh, I'm not very good at this and it does not bring me joy. So I just like stopped at like limits, like limits in infinite series. Like I very much was like okay, no more. I don't need this math in my life, so I threw it away. And but I think what's really really interesting, especially with computer science, like people who are in traditional computer science, is that like you do need to think about some of these math concepts and and kind of understand how some advanced calculus works. Like, but I have a I have a question for you. Like, when was the last time you had to think about things, and you had to like, oh, I remember like a math 
concept and you had to plug it into something that you're working on. It's been a while. It's been a while, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, and that's not a bad thing. I think what's what's great about tech is that, you know, we have an opportunity. Most of the problems, like very complex problems have been solved to some extent. And it's our uh it's our responsibility as technologists to stand on those shoulders of those giants and like solve business problems, right? And then in a situation where we need to solve, like do something that involves something complicated or some theory, like we can if needed, right? Um, awesome. So like you you had these conversations and you and you were inspired, right? Like were there particular areas of technology initially that you were interested in, or was it just like I love computers? I love the idea of women in computing. So I'm just going to attach myself to everything that I see. It was definitely everything I saw. Yeah. I kind of wanted to take it all in. I didn't really have a focus. Mm -hmm. I was interested in app development, web development. I'm still a polyglot where I like writing multiple languages. Yeah. I like being able to hop on the ML train if I want to. I like. Sure being able to pick different libraries depending on the language. And something that stuck with me was if you have an idea, you can build it. And if you don't know how, you can Google it. You can learn how. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that when they taught me that that day, that's really stuck with me of I just want to build. Yeah. So it and sounds to I'm me lucky that yeah. It sounds to me like you're a natural problem solver, right? Like the idea of solving problems is what you really are interested in. And like you just use technology mm -hmm. as like a tool to solve some problem, right? Whether it be in some language or using some tool chain. But I think, you know, rightfully so, like I think you kind of fit yourself into this area of machine learning because I think that, you know, anybody that follows you like, oh, like Lizzie talks a lot about machine learning concepts. Like what is it about machine learning that interested you so much when you first came across it? I first got into it because there's a Twilio product that was sure. new. I and see. As a developer evangelist and developer relations, we make a lot of content. Mm -hmm. And I was all, this new product needs content. So I need to yeah, use it. Yeah. And I was barred by the product team. And I think it was just very exciting. Even pre pandemic, there were all these updates happening, there were all these libraries, and they kept getting better. The models kept getting better. better. <laughs> And even now today, with the rise of ChatGPT, there are so many updates and improvements happening every day. It's yeah. just, you cannot keep up with it. But I want to try. But you yeah. cannot. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like, even if you just say machine learning, like, machine learning means completely different things to different people, right? Just like AI means different things to different people. Like what tools are you using? What, um, what models are you building? Like what's your end result? Like, I mean, obviously it's safe to say like you can be like on the technology side where just you're looking at tools and things. And then you can also just be on like the, the conceptual side, like data scientists and all that sort of stuff. Like where do you like obviously with a math background and interest in, in some level of math like do you find yourself kind of drifting between those sort of those two disciplines not really but i do think math is everywhere yeah and i like how you can apply it to everything and same with the programming and ml you can apply it to sports like mm -hmm. sports data and i think there's i like data because and, I sometimes like numbers. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. But the data, you can find data that interests you. Like, I like looking at NBA data. I'm a big Warriors fan. Oh, I wish okay. They had, wish they'd made it farther this year. Sure. <laughs> what else? Shopping yeah, data. I, I shop a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. Like, it is funny. Like, you mentioned sports specifically. Like, I, I love baseball. So, like, you know, baseball is, is famous in, in the U.S. for, like, there are so many different statistics that exist in baseball specifically. And, you know, with those statistics, you can tell all sorts of stories. Like, you can lose, look at the same uh, sample set of data and make assumptions that contradict each other. Right. And that's why I think it's so interesting, like with sports, particularly in data, is that it's really dependent on what you're trying to accomplish with that data set. Right. Um, yes. Like you play around with like NBA data. Like I'd love to hear like some things that you've thought about and like maybe some things that you've learned, like from looking at sports data with your you know, machine learning interest and your, your math interest. There's like, oh, like I bet you the common sports fan or the common basketball fan wouldn't be aware of that sort of thing. Oof. 
And I'm not trying to put you on the spot. If you can't think of anything, we could talk about something else, right? Um, no, this is good. This is interesting. Yeah. I think I'm always, I would love to be able to predict a winner. Sure. And that was one of my um, computer science product projects, senior year of college, trying to predict who would win. I think it's WNBA, a WNBA uh, final based on, we picked different stats to look at, mm -hmm. like a team's number of three pointers, maybe, or free throws percentage shot. And maybe it's because sports, you can't really predict. Sure. I love upsets. Sure. I love yeah. underdogs. Someone can get injured and you can't foresee that. No. And if you're a baseball fan, I love Moneyball. Yeah. Yeah. Data doesn't tell the complete story. Like data. I like to think it could tell the complete story, but there's all these hidden factors. Oh, sure. Yeah. At the, end, can't at the end of the day, you still have to, people have to, um, like human beings have to basically respond to those statistics, right? Like, you know, it's, it's always funny when you see like some statistic and there's always some statistic there. Like everybody, if you watch like sports television or sports radio or whatever, or listen to sports radio, like they always bring up some stat to tell, like, you know, you know, basically put truth to their opinion. But it's also funny because sometimes like that opinion is just wrong and they just use stats to basically double down on their opinion, even though their opinion is wrong. Right. So one thing that I love about numbers and data is that it allows you to kind of paint a picture and you use it as a paintbrush. Right. Yeah. So I think one of the things, too, that's really interesting, you know, as we we talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that you've done in your career is that when you first had like that first, you know, epiphany of like, oh, I like technology. And but did you also kind of respond positively to the, the, the medium in which it was relayed? Like, obviously, now that you're in content creation, developer evangelism, right, like the the education or the teaching aspect of tech is very interesting to you. At what point in time? Was that something that you wanted to kind of attach yourself to? Since my freshman year of college, I've wanted mm. to be a developer evangelist. Wow. Because I used to want to be a teacher. And then I found That's programming fair. the summer before I went to college. And I went to my first college hackathon the fall of my freshman year on Halloween. It was YHack at Yale. And I remember meeting developer evangelists there and at the following hackathons. And they were the ones giving the demo, giving workshops, yep. helping students and mentoring. And I was like, you get paid to travel here and teach me yeah, and help yeah. me and give workshops. And they were like, yes. And I was like, yeah. you code and also teach and travel. And they were like, yes. And I was like, I want your job. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it, there, yeah, it, it is funny that, you know, there are some interesting i guess side effects of developer evangelism or developer relations like you know oh i travel i get to go to these interesting places and, and meet new kinds of folks and folks from different backgrounds and that's some of the things that i love is because i love being out in the community and talking to people right so like i think one of the things that's very very interesting to me is you know what is the style of of education that you prefer do you prefer you know like participation based do you like for um that sort of that lecture style like that really deep 300 level 400 level where people are taking notes the whole time like or is it a little bit of combination of both depending on the audience it's a combination of both part of me thinks when people just lecture at you you can take it in you can create it yourself but at the same time i don't know about you but i get distracted when i read yeah I, procrastinate i read like a few sentences a page and then i'm like okay time for a break yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, i'm world famous for like never taking notes like <laughs> and, and i joke with with friends of mine that it's like the second that i don't like you know that i can't comprehend or like basically store things in my brain anymore like is when i'm going to start to have lots of problems because my ability to take notes has never been really strong like even when i was in school i just kind of remembered things um so i do think yeah, I do think it's interesting how like different people learn differently too. Like what are some of the ways that you like obviously one of the things that's important about developer relations is our developer evangelism is that you you have to always be learning. So like what are some of the ways that you like to like learn new topics or new concepts? I like learning by doing. 
Mm -hmm. I like reading maybe the docs and then trying to build something with it. Maybe finding a tutorial and going step by step. Yeah. And something that I think has helped me has been some metaphors. Sure. Uh, I was trying to learn the new lane chain library last week or two weeks ago. And great product, really taken off. You should check it out if you haven't, if you're interested in machine learning. But the docs leave something to be desired. And they were trying to explain some concepts in the library. And I was like, why would I use this when I could just do this? Yeah. And then I asked, asked my sister teammate, Craig Dennis, who is a big, he's kind of low key famous on YouTube for okay. some of his API videos. Shout out to Craig. And he gave some metaphors. And I was like, I was like, why didn't they say that? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so that's interesting. Like, and I think what's, what I love about teaching folks is that, you know, one of the great things that I, that I see is that when people are learning, like they become far more engaged, like even people that are traditionally introverted, right? If they're, if they feel like they're a part of the learning journey, they want to contribute a little bit. So like you'll have people raise their hands if you're doing a talk or they'll comment on your, your YouTube or they'll respond to you on you know social media or whatever, right? Like, and these are typically people that more than likely aren't going to, what's the best way to phrase this? Like aren't going to just come out and just engage with you directly. So you're kind of making them feel comfortable, putting them in a space where they want to be a part of the conversation, which I think is really great too. Yes, and I think this is kind of like me where Growing up, math and science didn't come easily to me, so I had to work mm. harder for it. Sure. And I think that makes it makes me more suited to teach because I had to try different things, and I can help others who didn't understand some things. In college, I was a teaching assistant for some computer science classes, and some of the TAs I TA'd with had trouble explaining concepts because they only knew the one way that they knew. Yeah. And it had yeah. worked the first time. And I was like, no there's other ways yeah exactly it, it's funny too like it, you know people do get set in their ways right i think what's interesting too is when you try to convince somebody that's very opinionated like i can speak for myself because i'm very opinionated when people try to convince me like oh you should try this thing i immediately am like no don't care and then when i get when like that i guess that turning happens it's like you kind of have like this little epiphany of like oh like Maybe all of my opinions aren't the best, right? Yes, I'm trying to think of the last time that happened. And I feel like it happens fairly often with me because I also sure. feel like I have very strong opinions but loosely held. Yeah. And yeah, it can yeah. be like, I can see a cool blog post or a cool tweet or a cool gif and I'm like, I'll do it that way. I'll yeah. try that. Or yeah. I trust that person. <laughs> Yeah, I think too, like the, the trust thing is really important, right? Like if you, and just to use like tech social media as an example, not the best example, but an example nonetheless, like, you know, oh, I follow this person on Twitter. Maybe I've met them. I trust what they're saying because they're, I've never been burned by them in the past. So I'm going to take what they're saying and I'm going to try to extrapolate on it, right? Where else, like if I, something comes across my feed and I'm like, I don't know who this person is, like I you know, who is, I look on their profile, I'm like, ah, I don't know who this is. I don't know what they're doing. Why are they on my feed anyway? Um, I, I'm probably less interested or less, uh, um, what's the best way to phrase this? The, I'm not the like motivated to like go down the path of learning whatever they're trying to teach, right? Um, and it's very interesting because usually those are the people that you should be fault, like trying to find period, right? Because I'm very much of the belief that, yeah, I have tons of areas of growth and everybody has something to give me to help grow right mm -hmm. even people that i wouldn't expect yes and trust is like a big thing and yeah at Twilio for developer relations we say that we're engineers first mm -hmm. and then we're just sharing what we build yes and we need to be engineers first so we can build trust with developers yeah people we're trying to teach and talk to and build communities with and work with for our customers. Developers are customers. Yeah. It, it's it's pretty interesting too, like the idea of like, you know, when you're in developer relations, your whole responsibility is to kind of be that conduit between the business or the product or whatever, and then the people that are actually using it, right? Like, yeah. 
you know, I, I always love the, I, I've seen this metaphor a few times where it's like developer relations is like an iceberg, right? Like not the best analogy, but like you only see like the tip of the iceberg, but underneath there's like 95% of the iceberg, right? Like, so what are some of the things that when you first started getting into developer evangelism that you're like, oh, like this is part of the job too? Oof. I was a developer evangelist intern at a startup called PubNub, and that was really my first foray into doing the job. Mm -hmm. And it was very much blog post or create sample apps, make blog posts, give talks, give workshops, give demos. And I've always loved that. And I still do that. I think it wasn't until I was full time at Twilio and I was like seeing myself here long term. Sure, sure. And I was like, you would go to events and you, uh, like last minute shopping for something for the booth, trying sure. to get people to look, paying for prizes, trying to come up with prizes, setting up for events where at like 7 a.m. time to set up the booth. And I'm like, yeah. Sometimes I'm like, I went to college for this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> kidding, but kind of like it's not in the job description, but it's still part of the job. Yeah, that that is the one thing too that I was like that I struggled with initially is like oh like I just there's a lot of waiting, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're you know waiting to hear back from people, waiting to you know prepping for your talk, like or even like at the booth, like you're waiting to have conversations because like your whole job is conversations, right? So like everything that you're doing, like that's not having conversations is basically to support you having conversations, right? Conversations at the booth, conversations on social media, through your content. And it's very, very interesting because I hear, I see a lot of like developer evangelists, and I'm not saying that you are one of them, that kind of complain about like having to do things like sit at a booth or, you know, do this and that. And I'm like, well, what do you want to do? Like, do you want to just like give talks and then like be on Twitter? Cause like that, that doesn't bring any value to the business. Right. So it's very, very interesting. And I'd love to get your thoughts a little bit about like, what's the balance, right? Cause obviously in developer evangelism, you know, you, you have to basically prove that you're worth the investment, right? Because mm -hmm. there's not like a lot of really great metrics. There's not really great ways to measure success. Right. So like, so what are some of the ways that you've thought about like how to really, how do I showcase that Lizzie is doing a good job or what some of the things that like Lizzie is moving the needle. I think it's very long term yeah. where my best blog posts, my best performing blog posts have taken like an hour to make, an hour to write, like very mm -hmm. fast. Sure. And they just took off on Hacker News and Reddit for some reason. One of them, I use Comic Sans in the screenshots and people just kept commenting about Comic Sans. So that helped the algorithm <laughs> versus some blog posts that took me much longer. Yeah. I used TensorFlow and I was like, I need to get this out. I have so many mm -hmm. bugs. And when I finally mm -hmm. made the app, I was like, oh, beautiful. Like, did not move the needle on blog post views at all. But those are still helpful. Yeah. I still get emails from people saying, thank you for writing this. This helped me. And can we talk about another use case or something I want to work on? And I'm grateful that I've been at Twilio almost six years now, including my internship. And I feel like people have a lot of trust that what I do will influence developers. And it yeah. might not be the high numbers, but quantity is not always better than quality. Yeah. And I think yeah, it, you have to focus on good relationships and it, helping serving developers, even if it's not a high number. I love That's the good relationships thing. Like, I totally agree that, you know, the amount of effort that you put into a piece of content sometimes does not matter at all, right? Like you see people like throw up like, I mean, not to say that TikTok isn't like well calculated and really methodical, like some people that are really good at TikTok, but like a lot of it is like, oh, I'm going to record myself in the bathroom, like with some silly thing that I thought of, right? And that goes yeah. viral and that does things like, and then you'll see some other TikToks where like somebody obviously put a lot of work into like the editing idea, right? And maybe they're not, might not be as, as much engagement for, for whatever reasons. So I, I love the idea, which you're saying about relationships, where if you're able to make a connection with some individual, whether they're reading your blog and they're contacting you, like, cause that creates, 
that connectivity that really shows that you're doing something good because your job is to you know promote in some ways like the work of all of engineering all of product and mm -hmm. you know at the end of the day your, your job is to get people to use the stuff right or get excited to use the stuff right mm -hmm. and, and i think that's really, really interesting about the idea that without building relationships or without building that trust we can't do that yes and I don't know. Sometimes it can be tiring because mm -hmm. I remember my first year full time at Twilio. I was checking Twitter late at night. Sure. Someone had tagged me in a tweet, and someone wanted help with uh, some uh, payment issues. And it was like a CTO or something. And I was like, "Okay, I'll do this." And it was a Saturday night. No one else was online. <laughs> I was like, "I have to do this." <laughs> I don't know. It's like the small things, and. You had mentioned, we had mentioned earlier, I guess, about how there's things that you don't like about the job, but it's all connected. Yes. I think. Like, even if you don't like being at the booth, setting up for the booth. Yeah. Responding to Twitter DMs or at like on a Saturday night, mm -hmm. it all contributes to the end goal. And that can yeah. help you further down the line. You can get invited to give a talk later on. Or I don't know, I feel like. People notice the small things. Yes, I, I definitely agree. So I, you know, mentioned a couple of things that, that I, I struggle with myself and I'd love to get your thoughts too, is like, you know, you're kind of always on in this world, mm -hmm. right? So like, yeah. you know, whether it's having to present on the weekends or you're talking about like Twitter DMs or Twitter, you know, engaging in social media in general, like after hours, right? Like, how are you able to find balance? Obviously you have hobbies. Obviously there's things that you're interested in, like, you could easily spend 15, 16 hours a day, like doing the job because there's always engagement, right? Yeah. So like, what are some of the ways that you're able to kind of get that balance? It comes in waves. Okay. I feel like sometimes there isn't balance and then I'll have to balance that out by try not to check online, check social media for a while. Or I used to say yes to most requests. Mm. And now I'll ask for some follow-up questions and I'll try to help them solve it asynchronously instead of like hopping on a Zoom. Sometimes people will, I'm like, just ask me the question. Don't ask if I can help or like hop on a call, just ask the question. And then if I can try to help you within one or two messages or emails, then problem solved. Else then we can hop on a call. And I think I used to believe that my Twitter would just be professional. I would yeah. see a lot of people in Dev in DevRel, developer relations. And I was like, oh, I want to be like that. Sure. But you should be yourself and bring your whole self to Twitter. I, one of my teammates, I think it was my teammate, Brent Shuley said, people follow you for you. They don't yeah. follow you because of your company. So just be yourself, bring your whole self to Twitter, social media, Mastodon, whatever. Yeah, I, I love the idea too. It's like you're not just following me, you're or not just following the my content, you're following me. Because I mean I'm very guilty of like, oh, if I'm having a bad day, like I'm gonna go on a rant. Like, you know, and if and if someone wants to unfollow me or whatever because of that, okay. Like I, I think one thing that's interesting too is I'll see people that show up engaging in content and then they'll disappear. And then I'll get curious. I'm like, okay, what happened to that person? And I'll realize like, oh, they're no longer like following me. And I'm, and that's probably not the best thing to, to be looking into, but I'm just genuinely curious sometimes. And then I get into this rabbit hole of like, why did I say something that they didn't like? Did they, did they not like the content anymore? Maybe I did, maybe I switched employers and they don't want to learn more about that employer. Right? Like I, I love to kind of get your thoughts, like how much, I guess, attention do you spend to folk like the folks that you're engaging with right like because obviously some of them are folks that we know right like you know mm -hmm. tech tech uh, evangelism is a is a pretty small community and but from like the audience perspective like the folks that are consuming sort of the content mm -hmm. you're building like how often do you put thought into like that Ooh. i have very thin skin <laughs> okay i i i notice those things and I don't give it too much thought besides I'm like was it like my basketball tweet 
Oh no! Was it? Was it, it like definitely? It, def it definitely was not your basketball tweet. If, pe <laughs> if people are unfollowing you because you have a hot take on the Warriors, then that's a. I have concerns about that person. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I probably think about it for like a minute. Yeah. And then I'm like, it's not me. It's them. Where maybe I didn't keep in touch enough, but I don't know. And then it's like time to move on. Yeah. There's only one person. I mean, I kind of love it when they come back when they need help. And I'm like, excuse you. you oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh, well, well, look who's coming back. <laughs> um, yeah. No, but I mean, I love the idea, too, is like we're all in our we're all going through our tech journeys differently. Right. Like I've had conversation with people that, you know, may, like my area of focus is like dot net. Um, and people will come and talk to me. It's like, oh, I haven't been a dotted developer in years, but I still want to like pay attention to stuff. And, I, and I'm always very like, oh, that's interesting. So like, like .NET isn't a job for you. It's really not even a hobby. You're just kind of paying attention. Like that to me is very, very interesting. Like, have you run into folks like that where it's like, especially like in your space, like people are genuinely curious about, you know, um, things like SaaS providers like Twilio or they're interested in like machine learning or AI like and have you had people that are like oh I, I just came to your talk or I consumed your content because I was genuinely curious and I have like no need to use these things yes I think there's quite I think since the pandemic started there's been a lot more hobbyist developers mm, like they feel interesting. like they don't they don't need to do their job outside of work okay I think with machine learning, there's a lot more people who are like, this is interesting to me. Yeah. So I'm just going to do it for me. Sure. I'm like, I went to your talk at Orlando Code Camp, not because it was .NET, because I don't do .NET. Sure, but sure. I was like, I'm interested in you as a person, and I want to see your speaking style. And I was like, very uh, entertained by it. So that yeah. was good. Yeah. For folks, like, who, notes. for folks that have not had the luxury of seeing me present, it is a, a whirlwind of chaos. So... Uh, I point at people, I make fun of people, I make fun of myself. That's kind of my jam. Um, I, that's another thing that I love I love to talk with you about. Like, you know, obviously like putting together like content ideas is uh is a whole like area of focus, like when you're doing um when you're building content, you're in developer evangelism, but like also you have to have a personality to it too, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I, I probably know the answer to this, but like how similar is like the content creator Lizzie versus like the Oh, I'm, I'm out with my friends on the weekend, Lizzie. It's pretty similar. Yeah. And I think it's taken time for me. Ha it's taken time for me to have the confidence for that to be true. Yeah. I, when I was just starting out, I used to wear t-shirts and jeans mm. and I tried to fit a certain tech stereotype. I was like, I'm not going to be taken seriously, but I'm very privileged that I have two mentor moms. Shout yeah. out to Bear Douglas and Tomomi Amara. And Tomomi would wear pink. She yeah. had like a she would bike to the office and have like her bicycle helmet had cat ears. And I was like, All right. People people take you seriously as an evangelist, an advocate, even though you're feminine. You yeah. talk about cats. And yeah. that just really that's really stuck with me of like people can still take you take you seriously, even if you don't fit a certain stereotype, a certain yeah. image. Yeah, I, that's, I mean, that's, there's a ton to unravel there about like people, people's assumptions and like people, taking people seriously. I, I love the idea too. It's like, if you, like the more genuine you are, and I've said this a million times on the show and to people in private as well, like developers in general, like they are pretty good at sniffing out inauthenticity, right? Yeah. Like, so if you are, you know, not being authentic, not being genuine. You're literally trying to get in, you're, you're getting, trying to get engagement in like a, in a non-healthy way. You're trying to do things that are somewhat toxic. Like usually they get, you get called out pretty quickly. And if you don't, it's just a matter of time before you maybe take that one step in the wrong direction. Right. And I love to hear like the idea of like, Oh, the more authentic people are like, again, wearing cat ears or, uh, you know, all sorts of the silly things that uh, we do in tech to kind of get attention. Like it actually like helps strengthen our relationship with the audience. So, you know, you mentioned that you, you know, t-shirt, jeans, whatever, right? Like it, what is interesting to you about like the way 
you present yourself physically to the audience so like that's cat that's interesting and i i i do super things like i wear like a dot net belt right like and like people think that it's like that's a thing like that's really really corny but i'm like that's it's silly like i mean worst case like people like are like where did i get one of those and i'm like do you want one yeah yeah um yeah so like i guess i'd love to get your kind of get your thoughts of like how you can like how you in the past maybe have portrayed yourself to kind of like not get attention per se but to like show people like hey this is me this is like who i really am like it's not a gimmick uh, and I hope you enjoy what you're consuming. Hmm. I have an avocado skirt, mm. which I love, which people always think like develop avocados. Yep. I sometimes wear high heels. Shout out to Bibi Athmani. Uh, she, she's a .NET developer mm. advocate. I remember seeing her in heels on stage at Caribbean Developers Conference in 2018. And I was like, you can do that? Yeah. Like, she was so fun. Okay, we're getting off topic here. No, no, no. no. Like, BB's awesome. Yeah. Like, we can talk about yeah. BB. Like, that's totally fine. Um, yeah. I think, like, when you're yourself and when you're authentic, that's when you're at your most comfortable. Yeah. And it really shows through. If, if my company gave me talks to give, mm -hmm. I would not be as excited. I would not gesticulate as much my voice wouldn't be as excited. I wouldn't want to give sure. it as much. Sure. If they gave me slides, I'd be like, why are these slides so corporate? -y? Where are all the <laughs> yeah, gifts? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think just having the confidence to be yourself makes you a better speaker, a better developer. And it makes you more, people would want to listen to you, want to talk to you more, I think. Because as you said, developers have a good BS meter. Yeah, I mean, it, I think too, like the idea that it, it's about you feeling comfortable first and foremost, right? And if you're comfortable, like you are able to perform at your best. Like that's something that kind of transcends technology. That's kind of like a human condition thing. But I love the idea that it's like, you know, if you have to use content that you didn't create yourself, you might not be as enthusiastic with delivering it, right? I think we've all been there where we've had like, you know, some slide deck or or something, or you see a demo and you're like, that demo isn't super exciting. Like, how am I going to turn that demo into something that's cool that maybe people are going to like? Um, yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I think is very interesting about that space particularly is that, and maybe I'm, I'm in a, a place of privilege where I've had the opportunity to do that, where you used to say like, I'm not going to do this exact thing this exact way. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like I'm working at this particular thing, I'm doing this particular thing because I enjoy doing it. And I don't really see how I can get enjoyment out of doing it this particular way. And sometimes that goes over well. Sometimes people are just like, well, I mean, you're, you're not very like I'm not very good with with PowerPoint slides Isaac you're terrible at PowerPoint slides like we're going to use these ones that somebody who is actually good at PowerPoint slides made um so but there's there's this idea too about again back to like the idea of being authentic where at some point in time we kind of there is burnout right mm -hmm. and I think the idea is like the more inauthentic you are the more likely you are to get some form of burnout and that's my opinion. Other people might disagree with that. I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on like, obviously it's a slog being in technology, right? Like we're, we're all a bit of masochists. We all put up with a lot of stuff. Like, you know, how do you, like, when do you do come into situations where you're kind of feeling burnout or you're seeing like, oh, if I go down this path, there's gonna be burnout. What are some of the things that you do to kind of rectify that? Good question. I think something that has helped me change how I view my work and burnout is I don't expect work-life balance. Mm. I expect work-life harmony. Interesting. Some weeks, some days, I'll work more hours, work longer, and it won't be healthy for like a day or a week, but sure. then later on, I'll take, I'll get that time back. And sometimes like you need to work extra hours for a conference, for a deadline, for a talk, Sometimes if I'm really excited about a project, I'll be heads down because I'm like, I need to get this out. Not like I need, like my manager's not being like, you need to do this. Yeah, yeah. But I personally, for my soul, I'm like, <laughs> I need to get this out. For example, I made Wordle over SMS last year 
two years ago. And I spent like a day on it. And I was like, heads down, didn't leave my apartment. I was like, I should, I could probably go for a walk, but I want to get this done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like the next, the following days, I was like, I was a sloth. I was like, <laughs> no more work. Like it's done, it's out. But I think that helps with burnout where it's kind of like in college where you hustle hard until finals. And then after finals, it's vacation. It's holiday. Yeah. So you need to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm <laughs> grateful I have friends and family who can help with that. I play a lot of tennis. Yeah. To take breaks. Yeah. Like the idea. So that's something I love to talk about, too. Like the idea of like finding like interesting hobbies. And for you, uh, like that's being, you know, getting your heart racing, playing tennis. Right. It's like. And I love to, I love to ask people this question, like, what are some of the, the things that you see when you're doing your hobby? Like, for instance, when you're playing tennis, like, what are some of the things that you realize or recognize that, you know, you act the same, maybe you have go about the things the same way as you do, like with your life in tech? Like, what are some of the correlations there? I'm very competitive mm, in work. Yeah. Yeah. In life. Yeah. I know. You should compete against yourself. But I'm motivated. I'm motivated by competing against other people. I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> I mean, I can... yeah, no, that that I mean that tracks. Like, I'm very competitive too. So like the idea of like I, whenever somebody's like, oh, I'm just kind of like doing this thing. I'm like, no, but like you're not like all in. Like you're not all in. Like you should be all in because I have to be all in constantly. Um, but I interrupted you. Keep going. Yeah, or like I'm on Strava when I run and bike. Mm -hmm. And Strava, you can compare your personal times over time. Yeah, yeah. But you can also compare yourself to other people who ran the same route or segment. Yeah. And I think, I used to think that was bad. But I think as long as you know <laughs> that, know what motivates you, that can be used in a good way. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Like, I... Um... I used to be a very, very avid runner. I used to run like seven or eight races a year. Uh, oh, I haven't been able to like go on like an actual proper run in over a year because of an injury. But so like oh. I, I've kind of transitioned to like doing like stationary bikes. So like there's a Peloton at my gym and I used to knock Peloton like and again, Peloton's not a sponsor. <laughs> I will obviously take a free bike if they want to give me a free bike. Uh, here, here. Yeah, here. right. Um, but like I was like, okay, I'll just give it a shot. And I literally was like, oh no, this is very problematic for me. Cause like, there's all these, I'm very numbers driven. So that there's all these numbers and all these things. And there's a leaderboard and you're competing against not only yourself, but other people in real time. And I'm just like, oh no, like I'm not going to walk at the end. Every time I get on the bike, like I can't get off the bike because my legs are so tired. Right. Like, so like, and, and that's great because that's what motivates me uh, to be fit, be athletic, whatever you want to call it. But I can definitely recognize why some people look at me when I'm on the bike and I'm just like looking like a mad person. They're <laughs> like, oh, like that person, I don't know what their deal is. But I totally agree. Like the idea of like competing against yourself helps you learn things about yourself, learn better. And then you can kind of directly tie that into like your work, right? Like yeah. if you do the same talk, I always say this thing, like I want to make each talk version of my talk better every single time yes. i don't want to like do the same talk literally over and over and over again like even if it's just engaging with the audience in a different way or talking about something from a different point of view like these are some of the things that i think are really really important um and it's not just oh you deliver this talk 10 times this year no like i delivered 10 different talks about the same topic yes and i always try to change like a slide or two or customize it to the audience yes like I was at JS de Verona in Italy uh, two months ago, and I tried to explain transfer learning, machine learning topic, mm -hmm. where you edit a trained model that was trained for one task to complete a similar but different task. And I said something like, if your model can recognize pizza, then you can make it recognize a calzone. Sure. And one guy tweeted like, oh, that was the best metaphor for transfer learning. I was like, oh. And I was like there very Italian. I was like, yeah. customize it for the audience. Yeah. So I give that talk a lot, but also I change a few themes like that. Yeah, I think it's it, it helps you stay genuine too. Because I've caught myself, like if I've done a talk for a few years 
And like, even though I, I try to switch it up as much as I can, like, unless there's like new things to talk about, you do find, you do catch yourself kind of falling into traps, right? Where it's like, oh, like, and I've caught myself, like, you're kind of on autopilot right now. Like, I jokingly say, like, I can talk about any topic for any amount of time, as long as you tell me like what, what, the, how much time it is, right? But when I'm talking about something that I've kind of got built muscle memory on, it's really, really challenging sometimes to kind of like step out and say like, no, like don't do this because people aren't getting as much out of it because they could watch a YouTube video, right? Yeah. So like, that's the big thing. Like, how do you continually try to grow or try to um, enhance the experience for attendees, right? I think when you give a talk, it can be heard how some of your jokes might not land. Yeah. And they might not land with one audience, but they might land with another. Yes. And you can't take it personally. Sometimes, like, try it a few times, see what happens. If no one laughs ever, try a different joke. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think just have fun with it. It's back yeah. to authenticity where sometimes the talk – the talk content could be bad, but if it's a good speaker, I'd be like, I will take it again. Like, yeah. give it to me. Yeah, it, it's funny, too. Like, and I never thought about this until I started presenting internationally. Like, cult, like some there are some cultural differences that, you know, the 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 experience as a speaker is substantially, substantially different. The first talk I ever did was in Copenhagen. And, you know, for folks that have done like seen me do talks like. I, I crack jokes. I try to be silly, like whatever. That's my style. And like, you know, it's in a room. There's like a lot of people in the room and I'm doing my thing. And like everybody's just kind of sitting there calmly. People aren't smiling. People are just kind of like whatever. They're nodding their heads. So I know they're in, they're enjoying it to an extent. But like nobody is like enjoying it. Right. And a afterwards, I was kind of feeling down and I was talking to a friend and I was like, yeah, I must, I mean, they must have not liked my American jokes or got my pop culture references or whatever it is. And the person quite simply said, like, no, that's like that. That's how people from Denmark are like they they're typically very polite. You know, they're somewhat introverted. They want to be proper. And that just is. And, I, and then at that point, I'm like, OK, so I'm going to do whatever I want then. Unless somebody like I see somebody in the audience who's like has their arms folded, like frowning. Like, I'm going to do whatever I want. Yeah. And it's kind of like enterprise developers are different than not just startup, but some enterprise developers. I'm like, you're so serious, but they can still like it. Yeah. Even though they also were like, might not laugh as much or smile. And I always try to find someone in the audience and make eye contact with them. And if I know them, they will probably make eye contact, smile and nod. Yeah. So you should probably like find someone like that. Yeah, that's also dangerous. Like I, I, I try really hard not to focus on one or two people because I got feedback a few years ago, like anonymous feedback was like they looked at me way too much. Like I was like, oh, well, I don't know. Like maybe you were in my direct eyesight. I don't know. Maybe I liked maybe I liked your facial hair. I don't know what it was. Right. Like yeah. I, I but it was I was like, OK, some people probably don't feel comfortable being looked at a lot. Right. So that was something that I'm like, so I'm, I, I do like the, just, I don't look at anybody. I just like everybody, it's like just a bunch of blurs unless I see somebody yeah. like who's really into it. And then I'll kind of like play off of that because they're actually into it. Yes. Um, yeah. It is very, very interesting though, is that like you're, you're in your room and you're speaking with like a, in front of like 50 people or whatever. And like every single person has like a reason why they're there and why they, and what they're hoping to get out of it. Like, what are some of the things that you try to do to instill that folks are like taking something positive away from these talks? Because that's the end goal, right? Mm -hmm. I think I saw either it was you or Cecil Phillip did at Orlando Code Camp, where in the beginning you asked for people's backgrounds and experiences. Mm. Like, are you a beginner, intermediate? Yeah. Maybe something about like enterprise versus startup versus yeah. mid-sized company. And I think that's more personal, that's more customized. Yeah. And it made people kind of feel more connected to the speaker. Sure. Yeah. And I think that could like maybe, even though you have the slides already done, mm -hmm. that could probably shape, yeah, slightly shape the direction that the talk could go in. Yeah, audience interaction is great. Uh, sometimes audience interaction goes horribly wrong, which I also think is kind of funny. Like um, I did a talk a couple of weeks ago and like one of my talks, like I 
I basically like everybody like raise their hand or whatever. And then I give away something like during the talk, like for the last person has their hand raised basically. And in this particular talk, like I think that people were very apprehensive about raising their hand. And I'm like, oh, this isn't going to go well. And then I had to like kind of explain it like you're like you're getting something at the end. So if you want this thing, you have to participate. Um, I saw I saw a talk by James Q Quick. I don't know if you know who James is. Um, he, uh, he he's been on the show. If you haven't seen that, check that out, folks who are listening. Um, but he did a, a keynote at a conference that I went to and he did like a lot of audience interaction. And every single time he was like, I know I hate it when I'm in the audience and somebody's like having me interact with them, but I'm going to do it because it's the only way that I'm going to like get my point across. Right. And I thought that was really good. And he did that like as a keynote. So there's a lot of people there. And I thought that that yeah. was really, really impressive. And, and I, and I had like a lot of respect for like the it's because it's it's a big swing, like hoping that the audience engages with you in that particular way, because if they don't, you're kind of like stuck. And then you kind of like have to invent some way to get your point across, which is always kind of interesting. Yeah, something I do in my Twilio five minute demo, but it's like the standard. I make an app on stage. I code it. I have people text in and then I call them because they get their phone numbers from them texting in. I'll ask like. Raise your hand if you've heard of Twilio before. And if people don't raise their hands, I'm like, me, or like, same. It's like, if no one volunteers, use yourself sometimes. Yeah, it, it's it's so funny too. Like the idea that, um, you know, we have all these like little mechanisms that we use to get our point across, right? And sometimes like, and I'll, and I'll take the example of like polling audience, right? Like if you're in a, uh, a small room, polling audience is great. But if you're in a large room, polling audience is like, okay, like I guess like half of you, that's good. I don't know. You can't really engage with an audience as they get bigger. Um, here's a question for you. And I'd love to get your thoughts on like, obviously you probably presented to, you know, smaller rooms because that's how it is. And then you've obviously presented in larger rooms, right? Like wh what is like kind of like the happy medium for you? Is it like in the middle? Do you like that more personal approach? Like, okay, like four people show up to my talk. Oh, well, I'm gonna make sure that's a great experience for those four people. Or do you like like the rush of like, oh, there's like a lot of people like putting attention on me right now. Oof. You can say both too. You can say both too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give an answer that I hate getting back, but it depends. <laughs> Yeah, it depends on the audience. I think if I do like the intimacy of a small crowd, yeah, you can make eye contact easier. You can get to the, know them more. But if I'm in a small audience, sometimes I'm like, I don't want the speaker to notice me. I just want to sit here and consume. Yeah, yeah. So, and I do like the rush of a big audience, kind of like the unknown. Will like will my will my demo work? Yeah. Can. All this, all this big number of people text in. Can I app? Oh can yeah, those those sort of things. Yeah. I, I will never do that. I don't trust technology enough. <laughs> I really don't. I do that a lot because yeah. you know Twilio. I'm like audience participation. Yeah. People text in. Yeah, have to get Twilio in there somewhere. Yeah, but... no, that's an easy plug. I just get very very terrified. Like when anybody puts like a poll up or an engage like a way to engage that way like qr code or whatever i'm like okay what is the worst I, my brain immediately goes what's the worst that can happen right now like like page like shows up like page cannot be returned or whatever i'm like oh no like okay well moving on but i guess that's part of the that's like the rush of doing the, of doing talks is like demos fail and you know i think the the best speakers that i've ever seen like how they've been able to kind of navigate when things don't go like a hundred percent the way that they're supposed to, how they kind of navigate that. That's what's I always find very interesting. Yes. And I've found that people love it when you mess up. Oh, like I, if, yeah. <laughs> if I give I, a demo and the code works the first time, some people are suspicious. So sometimes yeah. I try to add in like a typo. Yeah. 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 I, so I have this theory about like people who like to watch like folks like live stream code. Like there are people, there are like tons of folks out there that like will code for like two or three hours at a time. And my honest belief is that the reason why people like to watch people code for three hours is not just like you're learning how to do something end to end, like that's really valuable, but people also like to see like others fail. 
Like, you know, because like if you're going to be coding for three hours, like more than likely there's going to be a typo. Like um, I have a friend of mine, Jeff Fritz, who like he live streams a ton. And like whenever he types in something wrong, like you just see like the chat just explode with people trying to correct them. Right. Like and yeah. that's and I think people really enjoy like that because they feel like they're part of the the journey. Right. Yeah. And that's what I think is really awesome about that sort of idea and like demo failing too. like the amount of times that I've like typed in something wrong. And some I hear like somebody in the front row, like has a, just whispering something. I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to come up on stage and help? Because this would be awesome. Um, yeah, it's 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 fun because that show like shows the human like the good and humanity. Like people are trying to like help you when you mess up. Yeah. And same with Stack Overflow. I answer quite a few questions on Stack Overflow, yeah. especially under the Twilio tag, but also not under that tag. And people love answering. Yeah. Like you don't really get much, but it's nice to be like, I know the answer. I can help. Yeah. There's maybe it's like an ego thing of like, I know something that this person doesn't, or I can fix it. But also there's like collaboration too. Yeah. And that's kind of connected to open source where it's kind of cool to work on something together, but you're separate. I think it, I mean, team, I, kind of. I think it, I think it kind of feeds, it kind of, it probably feeds the same, the same hunger that you have for just helping people and learning. Right. Like I yeah. think, you know, sure. Like we're all driven by vanity metrics. I think the people that aren't driven by vanity metrics, I think that they have something wrong with them to an extent. Um, <laughs> I have a, I have a good friend who's like, I don't care how many Twitter followers I have. I'm like, you don't, you don't care about how many Twitter followers. Uh, anyway. That's beside the point. Um, but no, like there is something to say is like if you can help one individual, like Stack Overflow is a great example because like somebody has to choose that your answer is the correct one, right? And even if you don't have like the correct answer, like the checkmarked answer, you might have an answer that is just as valuable, right? And like, because so you can get something out of that too. Like um, I was never really big in answering a Stack Overflow because I feel like kind of a fraud, like because it's it, it's 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 like okay like who am I to say because if I take something from like the docs and just paste it in or whatever right it's like who am I to say like somebody else can easily do this like so I just never really made a habit of going on Stack Overflow and looking for like questions to answer um, you know it, I looking back looking back now I'm like oh maybe I should have done that a bit more but I do think it is yeah. interesting because that's like direct like you know you can help one individual right now and multiple individuals in the future like solve some problem that they need an answer to like kind of now yeah that's interesting that you say that i think i used to think the same way mm -hmm. i did i would i had a teammate phil nash who was like the stack overflow guy and i remember being like why would i answer it when phil could answer it yeah but i'm trying to think of this quote kind of like i'm gonna modify it probably if not if it's not you then who else like, yeah. why not you? Or, yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, no, I, I get the I get the point. Like, it's kind of that if you if you think that you can provide some value, like, why shouldn't it be you? Right. Yeah, I think that's it's pretty spot on. I, and, I, and I love the idea, too. It, you know, one of the things that's very interesting about teaching folks and education in general is that you don't need to be an expert. Right. Like you just got to be I, I use the, the analogy or, or metaphor like you just got to be like one page ahead in the book. Right. I so love like, that metaphor. and if you're one page ahead in the book, you can teach you can teach the previous page like you can teach the current page. Right. It's not like I think a lot of people get hung up on being experts. And I don't honestly like I refuse to believe that like we're experts in anything like there are some people that are very, very good at what they do and they're subject matter experts in quotes like in their particular area of interest. But like, you know, the whole 10,000 hour thing, putting all that work into stuff like it takes a lot to like be considered an expert. And for the most part, like most of us have not put in that that time. Right. Yeah. And mentorship is a two-way street. Yes. I think you could be on a page behind someone and still help them. Yes. You have a different oh, that's true as well. That's true as well. Perspective. Yeah. I mean, this is something that I think is really important to call out too, especially like if you're mentoring people and trying to help people get into tech or help people navigate their way through tech is like, there are so many different ways that people learn things. So many people, different ways that people engage. And I think one of the things that I, I would love to kind of hear your thoughts as we're about to wrap up is like, when somebody comes to you, Lizzie, and they're like, oh, like I have some questions about getting started in tech 
and you know i want to go down this thing and this thing and this thing you know do you take a step back and say what 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 are you trying to get out of getting into tech do you kind of go down that path or do you try to help people with whatever path they think that they need to get on i try to figure out the why as you mentioned yeah. and yeah. i think in order to go forward you need to start behind a little sure sure get at the root of the issue root of the why will lead to the next path or multiple paths i think yeah i totally agree and, and with that you know we're you know we've been we're at time we've been talking for an hour um i i've loved this conversation i think that it's been really insightful for me like thinking how you come about different things and content creation and speaking and engaging with folks because i think that you know i really enjoy like the way that you've crafted your whole experience and i've learned a few things and i'd love to kind of you know as we wrap up i'd love to kind of hear you know folks maybe not know who you are or may not be familiar like what are some different ways that folks can get a hold of you or, or reach out to you yes you can find me on the twitterverse yeah at at lizzie pika l-i-z-z-i-e pika p-i-k-a -I -I like pikachu mm -hmm. on blue sky yeah i'm I'm just Lizzie, L I Z Z I E, oh, wow. which I'm very excited for. That's a big deal. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. yeah, and there'll be a list of some other uh, socials in the description for this for this podcast, right? So if folks want to follow Lizzie and see all the cool things she's doing and all the different spaces that she in, please check that out. And do you, so do you have any parting words as we sign off? Hmm. Oh, should have thought this through. For it, uh, actually. Blah, blah, blah. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to flip the script a little bit. I'm going to do this. So usually when I ask my guests at the end of the show, I do have one final question for them. And uh, that question, it, it is always a fun one to get the answer for. And I'd love to get yours. So if you can kind of, you know, think about the conversation that we've had about tech and about content creation, the community and engagement and all of that. And, but you only had one word to describe that feeling that you had. What would that word be for you? Probably joy. Joy. J -O -Y. Mm. Developer joy. joy. Developer yeah. joy. That's the way to go. That, I love it. I, that give you give you joy and also give others joy. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think if we're not yeah. happy, we're not like we're doing something wrong. I mean, yes. you don't have to be happy all the time, but you should try to be happy as much as possible. Yeah. And all I'd right. like to end on a quote. Sure. <laughs> I please, do. A quote. please do. Please do. Any last parting words? Yes. It's from the baseball movie, A League of Their Own. Mm -hmm. Of course it's hard. It's supposed to be. If it wasn't hard, everyone would do it. The hard is what makes it great. Mm -hmm. That's the second best quote from that movie. Um, the best quote obviously being, there's no crying in baseball, but that's a different I question. I thought you would say that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? That's the, uh, but no, I mean, I love, I've, I've heard that quote. I've seen that movie so many times and I, that quote like when you started reading it, I'm like, yeah, here we go. Because there is something to say about, you know, especially in tech, like we put up with a lot of nonsense and a lot of pain and all sorts of things for like that little dopamine drip, right? Of the good thing that happened. Because at the end of the day, like, you know, you don't really enjoy success until you feel struggle, right? That's a quote too. That's a very cliche quote. Um, but I think it holds up. And I, and I want to thank you, Lizzie, for being on the show today. This has been amazing. Uh, for folks that want to follow Lizzie on Twitter, just for instance, you can follow her on Twitter with Lizzie Pika, L-I-Z-Z-I-E-P-I-K-A. And there'll be a link to that down below. And if you like this, be sure to share it with your friends and let me know what you think. And if you want to be on the show, reach out to me on Twitter as well, Isaac R. Levin. And with that, that is the end. Thank you so much for tuning in and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.